It's a pleasure to introduce Dan Kalman from Emory. Uh, Dan has been uh, looking at uh, host pathogen interactions and in particular whether uh, kinases that are targeted by cancer drugs could be of use for uh, infection, uh, including tuberculosis. All right. Thank you very much for having me along to the meeting. Thanks to the organizers. Um, and I'll try to keep my remarks uh, brief so we don't miss dinner. Um, the uh, work I'd like to tell you about today is some work that's been going on in our lab for about the last decade or so. Um, and I'll focus today on, on TB. Um, but briefly, what we do in our lab is we study how pathogens move um, into cells, through cells, and out of them. Um, we're interested a lot in, in um, actually how pathogens garner host cell factors that are involved in, in motility. Um, and we're also uh, more recently interested in how the immune response um, affects this process. And what I'd like to tell you today is about um, a particular set of molecules that many pathogens use, not just TB, but um, also HIV and a host of others um, that uh, are used to in essentially in transit. Um, and these molecules are dysregulated uh, in cancer, and that brings up the possibility that we can actually use, use drugs to target them. Um, and in a sort of a nice serendipitous effect, the, the same molecules are used as part of, of, of our immune response, and the drugs have the the capacity uh, to augment the immune response. And in, our, in my thinking about, about TB, which is, I view as essentially a commensal organism, um, the changing the immune response to TB is a, is a good way to combat it. And so the drugs can do that. And I'll try to take you through some of the history of the idea and uh, where we came to it. We didn't do a big screen. Um, my, my history is in a cancer lab and this slide is from Mike Bishop. Um, and, but dating back, um, if we start with Pasteur, Pasteur showed that germs cause disease, and shortly thereafter, people thought, well, germs would also cause cancer. And Rouse, uh, who discovered Rouse sarcoma virus, was a proponent of that. Um, later, Mike Bishop and Harold Varmus showed that, that some viruses, like RSV, could harbor or take a cellular gene and then use it for transformation in, in cancer. Um, and now we know other mutagens affect the cellular gene and all sorts of things. The cancer paradigm has been well established. What I thought about was why was, would obscure retroviruses be the only ones to harbor these oncogenes? And um, couldn't a lot of bugs do that directly or indirectly? And, and that's what really led us to think about um, how other pathogens used host tyrosine kinases. And, um, whether we could use the now uh, prevalent anti-cancer drugs to inhibit pathogenesis. So I'll tell you where we started. This is, this is pox. This is the other scourge of mankind that's killed. I mean, TB's killed a seventh of the people who have lived. So pox has killed another seventh. Um, pox replicates extranuclearly, and it travels to the surface and forms these actin protrusions that allow it to spread, and it looks like, it looks like this. Um, the bugs are in, in green. And you say, well, what does pox have to do with a lot of other pathogens? You know, once. It turns out that pox um, uses a tyrosine kinase called ABL, which we well know um, from cancer. Uh, ABL has an ATP binding domain, a bunch of other domains. It's involved in cell motility. Um, we know that in, uh, and Peter Noel and uh, David Hungerford and later Janet Rowley described the, the translocation of, of BCR onto C. able to form the 922 Philadelphia chromosome. And that discovery led to uh, Brian Drucker's discovery of Gleevec as a tyrosine kinase inhibitor that could sit in the ATB binding pocket and, and prevent BCR able activity and thus um, kill the cancer. Um, turns out that. Um, that was useful for us because we'd been studying pox viruses, other pathogens, all of whom use uh, ABL and related tyrosine kinases to move um, pathogenic E. coli to make these actin protrusions we call pedestals, and pox to make these actin tails 
which we call tails. Um, and they allow propulsion, as I showed you. So the question we had was, can we, we use this? And, and this is my, from my son's book on the Pied Piper. Um, and I've, I've tried to protect the anonymity of our mice. Um, <laughs> And so what happens? Well, if you give Gleevec in a lethal pox virus infection, you can see this is the LD75, you can get uh, near complete survival if you, if you give the drug. Um, so that's, that's nice. It turns out also these animals remain, um, if you challenge them again a, a couple of months later, they survive uh, a, another lethal challenge suggesting that they've been vaccinated. So, um, the drug doesn't interfere with their immune response and it, it provides protection. And we've now looked at a lot of bugs and other people have now looked at a lot of bugs. The ones of interest to us today are TB, um, polyoma is associated with um, AIDS dementia um, and of course HIV. Um, all of, both polyoma and HIV use able family kinases, those slightly differently. And all these bugs use these kinases in a slightly different way. TB is, is a transit effector um, pathogenic E. coli is a surface actin effector. Uh, ABLE is used by polyoma for entry. And uh, so there's a variety of ways. And, and there's clinical studies now ongoing with polyoma where these with kinase inhibitors like Levac and Tisigna. And those studies are, are showing promise. Um, so what about, um, what about TB and, and what can we say about it? Um, well, if we, if we give uh, Gleevec, one of these tyrosine kinase inhibitors, um, in a macrophage experiment, what we see in control macrophages growing uh, over a period of eight or nine days, uh, Gleevec gives us two effects, one on entry, um, there's lower levels to begin with, and one later on, those are separable, um, and the effect of Gleevec is about fourfold. Um, it turns out that we can do this with a lot, a lot of mycobacterial species, and we've used other species as well in our studies for drug development, it's handy to have a fast growing species, in, particularly in macrophages and mice. And we've used Mycobacteria marinum, which in all respects that we've found behaves identically to MTB. Um, does the drug affect growth of the bacteria? It turns out that it doesn't. This is growth of TB over a couple of weeks um, with Gleevec, and it, there's no effect of the growth. So it doesn't do anything to the bacteria, per se. Um, this is an experiment we did with marinum because we couldn't get um, these fibroblasts to infect, but you can see that these are the control uh, fibroblasts and these are um, cells lacking ABLE and there's an effect there. It turns out the effect is more complicated as it is with many pathogens in that if you take ABLE null fibroblasts and treat them with um, uh, a drug, Gleevec in this case, um, you still see a reduction and that's because a lot of bugs use kinases promise in a sort of promiscuous manner or redundant manner. They don't care which kinase phosphorylates the target, they just want it done. Um, and we found this in every bug that we've looked at. So you have to kind of match an inhibitor to the kinase profile that's being used by the pathogen. So what does it do in, in animals? Um, and this, this is an experiment with marinum, and we see a couple of log effect um, with in a, in a dose response uh, curve with Gleevec. Um, and it works whether we deliver it pre-infection or post-infection. This is a seven-day experiment, so delivering it post-infection, we don't see as remarkable effect, a couple of logs here, but post it works less well because the bacterial loads climb and we're not getting complete clearance. I'll show you the TB um, data in a second. But I do want to make the point that Gleevec is effective against rivampicin resistant strains. We're doing this with MDR and XDR now. Um, it's also, interestingly, works in uh, synergy with, um, with antibiotics. That is, if, and this is TB here and marinum in vivo here. TB in vitro, you give a matrix of, of uh, either Gleevec or rifampicin alone or the combination. And you can see the, the uh, the fold in effects are not additive. You get a much larger effect when you have two of them together. And in vivo, you can see the same kind of effect. Low doses of both give you, uh, when in combination, give you better than the, com the additive sum of, of the two. And in vivo, I think the data makes uh, a good point. And the I idea is important because it says that we may be able to take an ostensibly antibiotic resistance strain and now give Gleevec and make it now sensitive to antibiotics. 
Um, and we think because Gleevec may affect the trafficking, it may make the bugs um, more susceptible to antibiotics than they would otherwise be. So what, are, what does the TB data look like in vivo? Well, for a drug that doesn't actually, um, isn't an antibiotic, what we're seeing is half the animals clear the infection and 80% of them are down two logs, at least. So um, that's quite good and we, we're really excited about this um, amount of clearance. Um, and the lim this is the limit of our detection, so basically half the animals we see undetectable levels of uh, bacteria. Um, so the uh, general conclusions of this are that we, um, a lot of bugs use uh, molecules. They're not, these kinds of molecules, because they target hosts, are less likely, though not completely unlikely, to engender resistance. The inhibitors have utility against drug-resistant strains, and they may render co-administered antibiotics uh, effective against ostensibly resistant strains. So how does it work? Um, this is new data um, for the large part, and I'll, I'll share it with you uh, here. Um, I'll tell you about two mechanisms, one of which we published, the other one we haven't yet. Um, and what, it, what we find is that the bugs end up um, uh, more so in the lysosomes than they do um, normally. And that's, that may be consistent with the idea that, that the drug with antibiotics acts synergistically. Um, the second, um, and things are always more complicated, the second uh, experiment came out of our understanding of how Gleevec works in vivo, um, and this kind of experiment I think wouldn't have been done if we hadn't done careful dose response curves. Because what we noticed was that the drug didn't work as well when we got to higher doses, which is remarkable. Um, and for me, that was, that was <coughs> excuse me, a good indication that we had some sort of immunomodulatory effect going on. And I would note that the concentrations of drug that we're actually using give serum concentrations in the blood of much lower levels than what the serum concentrations in a human dose would be, which would be, which would be somewhat up here. So the starting dose for CML is like 400 uh, milligrams QD, and we're looking at a tenth or uh, less of that. So the maximum effect is low, and uh, it, this is the same as with TB. So we started to look for immune effects, and we saw something quite remarkable with just the drug treatment alone. We saw massive increases in neutrophils, um, but it wasn't just neutrophils. It was also monocytes and all other cells in the myeloid lineage. Um, lymphoid cells weren't particularly affected, but interesting, you see the same kind of thing happening with infection, in this case, a marinum infection. And this is something that develops very quickly uh, with infection. It's called the emergency response, um, which probably many of the immunologists in the audience are familiar with. Um, and it's quite dose dependent, such that we see these increases at the, at the doses where the drug is most effective, but not at the higher doses. And this is looking at blood levels and neutrophils, but the same is true for other myeloid cells. So what's happening? Um, well. Myelopoiesis is, happens in the bone marrow. You, see, you have an exodus from the bone marrow. The cells often will get activated. Uh, in case of neutrophils, at least, they apoptose. Um, the emergency response is known to affect this process. So um, when we looked in bone marrow, you saw a massive increase in cellularity with the drug. Um, the neutrophil numbers are increased, as you might expect, um, and likewise a little bit with infection. Um, the, uh, we also saw effects on exodus, and we, when we started to sort of take the process apart and look at myelopoiesis in particular, um, I probably should review this briefly. Um, myelopoiesis starts with a, a hematopoietic stem cell that becomes activated, differentiates into a multipotent progenitor, of which there are four. Um, and then into precursors, myeloid and lymphoid, which then di differentiate along the myeloid and lymphoid lineages and ultimately into mature cells. These cells are called the Linska kit cells, and you can see the effect of Gleevec on that population here. Um, and they go up about two to four fold. They also go up with infection. Um, if you break those down and you actually look at the cell types in particular, 
Um, you don't see actually a, an accumulation of the stem cells with the drug, though you do with infection. But interestingly, the, with infection plus the drug, these coming are, the uh, stem cells decrease, which suggests to me that the uh, stem cells are just transiting through the differentiation pathway. And you do see with um, either the drug alone or with infection accumulation of the, of the, the uh, progenitors, the MPPs. And you can see them particularly here with infection or here with drug, here with infection, and infection plus drug. And the precursors are unaffected, and the mature cells I already showed you um, go up. So um, you, can, you can get cells out and show that of, of the bone marrow, culture them and see these kinds of, of increases. These are from animals treated. And it also works with animals that uh, have um, high levels of drugs, so the effect of the drug on the early myelopoiesis is not dose dependent. Um, and it works, does it work on human cells? And it turns out it does. Um, and this is human marrow and you can actually just treat the marrow and you can see this, this kind of dose dependent uh, increase in vitro. Um, and I'll, I'll ask, you, one might ask whether it's relevant to people. Um, we're trying to get some of the information out of Novartis uh, patients, but I will refer to um, Brian Drucker and Charles Sawyer's initial paper on Gleevec in the New England Journal of Medicine years ago. And what they say is that this is using CML patients, is that Gleevec um, at low doses, um, these are about a tenth of the, of, now, of the dose we now know we give for CML, were removed from the study within two months because of elevated white cell count. So this, is, uh, this was intolerable in the CML study because they already had elevated white cell counts. But I think it's indicative of it, of it happening in people um, independent of the leukemia. And I think uh, that's, been, um, that's been confirmed unofficially by several people who have done these studies. So I'm trying to get the data on that, which will be important for our study design. So we have an effect of Gleevec on myelopoiesis. Um, it turns out there's an effect on, on exodus from the marrow, as in evidenced by effects on CCR. CXCR2, um, which uh, increase in consistent with the increase in, in uh, myeloid cells in the, in the periphery. The cells are not activated, but they are activatable with infection, and there's no effect on, on uh, in, at least in neutrophils, on their, on their uh, capacity to undergo apoptosis. So this isn't increased, um, this is unaffected. So it's kind of like you have more policemen the donut shops mm -hmm. without their guns drawn is sort of the way I look at it. Um, so what's the effect? Well, it turns out to be independent of ABLE, but rather dependent on KIT, because you can give C-KIT neutralizing antibodies, and these produce also an increase in myeloid cells, but they also affect the lymphoid compartment, suggesting that we have an effect on the stem cell to myeloid progenitor differentiation that's due to a partial inhibition of KIT, but that lineage determination effects are, are KIT independent and uh, due to some other inhibition effect. And then there's effect on migration, because at high levels of the drug, you don't see um, migration of the myeloid cells out. So that's where the drug dependence comes from. And it's important because um, the trial will depend on, on hitting the right dose. So um, let me ask whether it's just a numbers game. Um, increasing all myeloid cells is, is potentially a good idea if you want to, if you want to hit a bug. And we showed uh, we can take um, uh, neutrophils from Gleevec or uh, control-treated animals, inject them into a mouse, and then infect them straight away. And we do see an effect, but there's no better effect of the neutrophils coming from these mice as opposed from to naive mice. So it's, it really is just an increase in number. And the more you have, the, the merrier it is if you want to kill the bugs. And based on Joel Ernst's work um, and our own work, we see, we see an effect on, on infection of neutrophils. And Joel's model is that when TB infects, uh, it infects um, neutrophils and macrophages that come into the, the lungs quickly and initially after infection, followed by uh, dendritic cells. Um, the dendritic cells will eat the, uh, the neutrophils and the macrophages. If the dendritic cells get infected, uh, bacteria makes a 
factors that prevent them from migrating to the lymph nodes. But if they, if they eat the infected neutrophils and macrophages, they'll migrate and, um, and give you a pretty good antigen presentation. So um, if you have more, um, you'll have a better chance of eating and destroying the bugs, better chance of, of, um, of allowing the DCs to uh, engulf infected cells and better chance of getting better antigen presentation. Um, so our hypothesis is that Gleviec is maybe in an anti-infective by stimulating uh, an innate um, response that may lead to a better adaptive response, which we're trying to test. Um, but the Gleevec effect is titratable, and um, it may be very useful to mimic an entire anti-infective emergency response rather than um, just particular cytokines. So neutrophil uh, increases by, with drugs, are essentially ineffective against treating various infections, but we're increasing the entire myeloid compartment, which seems, uh, at least in our hands, to give half the animal's clearance potential. So that's good. Um, so I'll just talk briefly about, uh, about how we think about um, moving Gleevec along. Um, it's off patent in the next year. Um, we're trying to develop some upscale or scale up synthesis that will allow production uh, at low amounts. Um, I think it's possible to develop with a combination therapy. It becomes sort of a Walmart strategy. You sell a lot for uh, pennies above cost and you can do okay. Um, and it's got applications to obviously neutropenia and some other things. And with Dick Chasen and, and Hank Blumberg, we're starting to develop the concept of a trial based on um, pretty much the delaminid trial with the dose escalation um, in MDR TB patients plus the normal an antibiotic regimens, which is standard of care. And then we would like to do Gleevec at a couple of doses. Um, and then the primary outcome measurements are a lot like the ones that, that we talked about the, this morning, uh, sputum culture, um, time to sputum culture conversion, and the durability of that conversion. So um, people ask often about um, adverse events and severe adverse events with Gleevec. It turns out there are very little, especially at the low doses, and all the severe adverse events um, are associated with very much higher doses and are in um, patients who have pretty um, confounding conditions like multiple um, uh, medications and also far progression of, of CML. So there have only been eight fatalities that I'm aware of in, in the 15 years that the drug has been on the market. So Gleevec and heart, it turns out that heart, heart therapy is entirely uh, compatible with uh, Gleevec. Um, the evidences are that Gleevec patients, uh, CML patients who are on heart, um, don't get worse um, uh, HIV, and they don't get worse uh, CML. That's basically the, uh, the data I have. Um, there will be, um, have to be modifications of the, the TB regimens because uh, rifampicin induces uh, CYP3A4, which is the metabolizing enzyme on Gleevec, but rifibutin works fine, and we've shown that. Um, so, um, I'll stop there and acknowledge uh, many collaborators. Allison uh, did a lot of the various people doing various work with this. Padmini and Rafi helped us with a lot of the TB work. Deepak is my um, uh, monkey collaborator, and um, I've had various other folks helping us, and with ACDG, uh, Hank and Dick and some other folks here, uh, Dennis Leota, who developed Mtrava, has been a, a long-term advisor, and here, George Dimitri, who ran the GIST uh, trial for Gleevec, and, uh, and Gail, and Tom. And I thank uh, Christian Brichot, um, then at Biomare U, and now at uh, the head of the Pasteur for uh, funding. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
So um, I, I don't need that. I guess I can talk here. Um, we do see uh, pathology effects with infection in mice. Um, it's hard to call them granulomas. I don't think they are. We really wanted to do this in the primate model and the rhesus model. Um, and we're trying to get that done. Um, it'll be a lot clearer there. What we do know is that Marinum makes a, uh, a skin lesion that is uh, identical to a, a granulomatous lesion by all the pathologists in my department's estimation. And Gleevec completely eliminates that lesion. Um, so you can give it after infection and show that those lesions um, disappear. Um, I don't know how it'll work in, with an advanced granuloma. Um, we don't know how it'll work in latency. Those are key questions. Obviously, those are the treatment population that we're looking at. Um, there's been a strong effort on our part to get funding for doing um, that experiment in the rhesus model, either with latent TB uh, animals or with reactivated animals, uh, reactivated either with SIV or with uh, immunosuppressants. Can I ask about resistance and tachyphylaxis? So um, for the uh, motility effect of Gleevec, have you looked to see whether with uh, chronic uh, exposure the uh, bacteria can um, so so in other, in other experiments with other uh, faster growing organisms, we've, we have looked at that and we don't see development of resistant strains. It, but you know, we, we've given uh, various malarial drugs uh, which target host uh, trafficking pathways and malaria have developed resistance to things like chloroquine, um, which is host targeted. So it's not impossible, it's certainly less likely than a direct uh, killer, um, and our, our contention is that the drug is stimulating both a, um, an effect that makes the bacteria less likely to survive, as well as a, a somewhat non-standard immune response, though a, uh, an immune response that the bugs all often see, and that we're, <coughs> we're able to give something that's different. But it could mobilize white blood cells from the bone marrow in other ways. Is you could. I, it's certainly possible. There are, there are drugs that do that, and they, um, um, GCSF is one of them. Right. It's completely ineffective against almost all infections, uh -huh. and it primarily mo mobilizes neutrophils, not all hematopoietic or myeloid cells. So um, we got, I think, a little lucky in the sense that partial inhibition would, would drive myelopoiesis, which is something that is which is a normal response to a lot of infections. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Dan.